Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to call this session of the Washington History Seminar to order. We're here today to listen to John A. Lawrence talk about his new book, The Class of 74. My name is Eric Arneson from George Washington University. I'm co-chair of this seminar, along with Philip Estrom, who represents the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, as many of you know, uh, this seminar is a collaborative effort of the American Historical Association's National History Center uh, and the Woodrow Wilson uh, uh, International Center for Scholars and the History and Public Policy Program uh, in particular. Um, Behind the scenes, we have two folks, Pete Bierstecker uh, and Amanda Perry, who work very hard every week to make sure that we can all be here, uh, that our speaker is here, uh, and that we uh, get the intellectual riches uh, that we come for. Uh, so our appreciation to them and to various funders, the Society of Historians of American Foreign Relations, Schaefer uh, has generously helped to underwrite this seminar as have various anonymous donors. And as I say every week, please join their ranks. Uh, we welcome your support. If you have one of these devices, everyone does, you know it's on, please turn it off. Uh, invariably, somebody's phone will have a lovely ringtone uh, uh, at an uh, inopportune moment uh, in the next uh, hour and a half. Uh, and with that, uh, I will ask Philippa to introduce today's speaker. Thanks, Eric, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to interview, uh, to introduce John Lawrence, or the rest of you can interview him in the Q&A session, who, as you know from the invitation, has a PhD in American history from Berkeley and is now a visiting instructor at the University of California Washington Center, where he teaches Congress and politics in Washington, and of course, History and public policy coming together, this is the man to do it. Um, very frequently we have people who come from a life in academia and so heavier on the scholarship side. Now we're delighted to have somebody who's very heavy on the policy side and who has helped to make policy as a congressional aide for 38 years, first for George Miller with whom he worked for three decades as a legislative director and then uh, chief of staff. He was the minority staff director of the Education and the Workforce Committee. And then he was chief of staff for Nancy Pelosi from 2005 until 2013. And before I turn the microphone over to him for the class of 74, you may know, but I don't know whether everybody in the room knows, that the class of 74 is also the name of an Australian soap opera that <laughs> ran in the 70s and that featured particularly four young women having interesting sexual encounters. So I don't know whether your presentation is gonna be quite that racy, <laughs> but in any event, we're delighted to welcome you here. <laughs> Thank you, Philip. Well, with that introduction, it's, it's been a pleasure being here today. Um, actually, to tell you the truth, I do know about that. Um, I was uh, at one point uh, Googling the class of 74, and uh, that, uh, I thought it was a movie, actually, but it popped up, uh, and the, the poster for the movie is a very entertaining poster. And I sent it to my agent, and I said, don't you think this would be a better cover for the book than, uh, than mine? It would sell, certainly sell more copies, so, but uh, she agreed, but nevertheless, uh, <laughs> we went with the original. Well, it's a real honor to be here uh, uh, today and uh, to see a lot of friends uh, around the table. I think unlike some of the talks that I'm going to be doing uh, for this book, I, there are a lot of people around this table who uh, know certainly at least as much as I do, in some cases a lot more about Congress um, but uh, hopefully not that much more about the class of 74. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really happy to be here and I appreciate the invitation uh, from the Wilson Center to come and, and speak with you. So I'd like to give you an idea about what I try to do in the book, but particularly recognizing the expertise of the folks in the room. Uh, I want to leave a lot of time for questions and answers or, or, uh, or discussion, I think may be a better way to put it. And I think today is a is a really appropriate day to, to think about some of the bigger themes that I talk about uh, in this book, um, because uh, this is the day when um, 
as you may know, when uh, President Trump had set a deadline uh, for Congress to act on the DACA program. And I look at this drama that has developed around DACA almost as a, as a little symbolic uh, version of, of some of the issues that I talk about in, in this book and, and that I think have to do with the history, uh, particularly the modern history of Congress. Uh, this DACA crisis is a, is, it's a crisis that's sort of manufactured in that uh, the program was set up by an executive order because Congress couldn't figure out how to do con immigration reform. Then the Congress uh, was, then the, it was voided by an executive order, and then the courts stepped in, and then the president told the Congress to act by March the 5th today, and the Congress didn't act, and now the judiciary is, so everybody's in the game except the Congress, which the last time I checked Article 1 was supposed to be creating national immigration policy. Uh, and that's, uh, in, in a microcosm for me, it's illustrative of some of the significant problems that are facing Congress and raising the public skepticism and, and, the, and the public uh, uh, dissatisfaction levels with both Congress and I think government uh, more generally. So in some ways that's reminiscent of a bit of the atmosphere that, that was occurring in, in, in the Congress uh, in the late 60s and in the early 70s as well. And that's the story that I want to tell in this book is about what, what happens uh, in the early and mid-70s that both have a dramatic impact in terms of the, uh, the functioning, the structure uh, of, the, of the House of Representatives in particular, and I can explain why I deal more with the House than with, with the Senate, um, but also to keep it in the context of other developments that are taking place in American politics. As a historian, you know, you, you have to be careful not to break out one event, and uh, usually whatever that event is is the one that the person has decided they're going to write the book on, and uh, that defines everything. But in fact, the changes that are occurring, both with the class itself and then the actions that are that are uh, taken by the class, all are happening in a, in a context of a, a roiling change in American politics, and you have to integrate all those pe pieces together, I think, to get an accurate view both of, of their history and also uh, of uh, American political history at, at, at that point. I think one of the great valuable uh, contributions of this book uh, is not something that I've done, but something that the members of the class did. Uh, I was able to interview uh, over about 40 members of the class, and including some other uh, former members, uh, as well as uh, staff, um, some press people, some advocates, all of whom were active at that time. And uh, they provided me with, in many cases, insights, uh, anecdotes, uh, observations uh, that were incredibly valuable and were not available anywhere else. Uh, most of members don't keep particularly good archival records. Most former members do not write books or articles about their experience. And yet, as anybody who has worked in Congress knows, these personal relationships and these personal experiences are uh, vital to an understanding of what's actually going on. You can read the vote record, you can read the committee reports, but it's the nature of the interpersonal relationships and the stories that can be told that really explain the nature of the legislative process. And, and I was able, because I knew these guys, I came to Washington at the same time, and I was able to call them up or email them, and they knew me, and they were willing, I think, to entrust uh, in me, uh, their, their, their stories. And I've, they have played a significant part of the primary research that goes into uh, this book. They were interesting, they were fascinating, most of them time where they were true. Uh, occasionally, not quite, they were off by a few years, but that's okay. Uh, and and so, as I say, sometimes they're really funny. Uh, but at the same time, they're, 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 they're very instructive. So I have this wonderful story between Marty Russo, who's a member from Illinois, uh, and who was sort of unwillingly drafted into running for Congress because he was told that was the way that he could get a judgeship, which is what he really wanted, but he had to lose. <laughs> that, was, that was the key. Uh, and he, had, he, and he uh, unfortunately, he won. He told me his career was ruined. And he, uh, <laughs> but he had to, he spent his whole career in Congress, which lasted until the early 90s, um, being criticized by a lot of people as just a tool of Mayor Daley.
In fact, he had never even met Mayor Daley before he decided to run for Congress, and he had this great encounter where he was finally, after he was told that he was the nominee, he was shuttled into a room with Mayor Daley. Marty, at that point, had long black hair and a big beard. He looked a lot like the people who Mayor Daley's police had been banging over the head a couple of years earlier in the streets of Chicago. And he was, he was just overwhelmed by the experience of meeting Richard Daley. And, uh, uh, and uh, they had a nice exchange, and Mayor Daley finally said, well, Congressman, you just keep, he wasn't a congressman, you know, bumping him up a little bit, he said, you just keep fighting, you keep working hard, and you're going to do just great. And Marty felt, wow, this is terrific, I'm, they love me, I'm going to do great. And he turned to leave, and he heard Daley say to his aide, that was the best we can do. <laughs> uh, which, as you can imagine, which is, you can imagine, Sandy Hoare probably knows that, right? But that, 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 that deflates your ego, you know, when you're, when you're a kid. And then there's, there's a wonderful story in here. There are a lot of these stories, but again, they, 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 help, they help tell a, a, a broader uh, uh, story about the, the nature of the class and the nature of the Congress. There's this wonderful one about Jim, with Jimmy Blanchard, who was a, a Michigan member, went on to be governor, then was ambassador to Canada. And he, like many of the members of the class of 74, was... Uh, very frustrated with the slow pace and particularly with what they thought was the inadequate leadership of, uh, the, of uh, Carl Albert. And uh, he uh, went to Tip O'Neill, who was at that point the majority leader, and said, uh, Tip, I think that what you really should do is lead a coup against Carl Albert. Uh, misreading Tip O'Neill's view of how leadership in the House of Representative, uh, Representatives work. And then the book starts, I'm not going to tell you this one in, in any detail, but the, the book starts with a wonderful confrontation between William Barrett of Pennsylvania and Tom Downey on the House floor uh, in early 1975. Uh, Barrett had been serving in the House for two years when Downey was born, and, uh, and then Downey shows up at the age of 25 uh, on the House floor, and the two of them have an interesting encounter um, that uh, I, I confirmed through several sources because it sounded a little too apocryphal, but uh, it, it, it actually did occur. And to me, it just symbolizes the, uh, the clashing of these generations and the, the, uh, the struggle that both had in trying to understand uh, the other. So there, there are lots and lots of those accounts that I think are not only helpful in terms of explaining the, the uh, history of the, of the class and the history of the Congress, but that really would have been lost to history. I mean, the hardest part in some ways of writing this book was editing it down because anything I took out I thought would never, was probably not gonna appear again. Um, and uh, fortunately, I was able to keep most of that, most of, uh, most of that in. Uh, as I say, I came to DC at the same time. I worked in George Miller's original campaign. Um, I arrived with some of the same naivete and very, very broad expectations that members of the class did. Um, uh, it, it was a remarkable transformation for me. I thought in graduate school I was going to be a professor uh, and uh, ended up, you know, a 38-year uh, hiatus uh, before I began an, an academic career. Um, my wife, tell, who is an academic, tells me you have to actually work somewhere before you get a sabbatical, so it's not quite a 38-year <laughs> sabbatical, but... Uh, no, but it was it, the, the I, I literally went from being a uh, from uh, hanging around Berkeley with my purple corduroy bell bottom jeans uh, and uh, mushroom belt uh, to sitting on the lawn of the White House next to the President of the United States singing Solidarity Forever uh, within two years. I mean, it was just a remarkable personal change for me, and uh, and I think I try to capture some of that that excitement and. Uh, that anticipation in, in the book itself. I think it's really, as I started off by saying, it's an important time to have a, a conversation about the Congress uh, because there is so much concern about the Congress losing its ability to perform its functions as the lawmaking, and not just lawmaking, but some of the other uh, requirements that, that, uh, that it has. One of the things that I think has really been, been set back significantly in, in the last several years is what had been a, a fairly bipartisan effort, I think, for, since the mid-1970s, for Congress to reassert itself as a co-equal uh, branch of government. You know, it had really lost that ability, it had ceded great authority uh, for a variety of reasons to the executive branch in the mid-1960s. 
Uh, Senator Clark of, uh, of uh, Pennsylvania writes a book where he, he decries Congress as having become the sapless branch of government. Um, and Congress on a bipartisan basis with the Budget Act, with the War Powers Act, uh, both of which were passed with strong bipartisan uh, support, uh, begins to reassert itself uh, as, uh, as having the primary role, both in terms of creation of legislation, but also in terms of oversight of the executive branch and holding the executive branch accountable uh, in a way that had, not been, had been, not been the case. And I think, unfortunately, what we've seen over the last several years for complex reasons is an inability of Congress to confront even issues where there's broad public agreement that there needs to be some legislative activity, even some of the basic housekeeping measures such as keeping the government open and funding the annual budgets has become a very, very difficult challenge uh, for the Congress. Explaining that to people I've, I've always found to be a difficult thing and somewhat difficult to write about because Congress, as you know, is, for those of you who write and study it, it it's a, it's, it's a difficult subject. Um, it is uh, for, for a historian and, 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 for, and for political scientists and for journalists who write about it. The public has a difficult time understanding Congress. Uh, and, you know, it's big. There are hundreds of people. Um, the membership is changing. I mean, every two years, there's a new crew of 40 to 60 people who are coming into the House and anywhere from five to 10 people in the Senate. It's hard to know who speaks for the Congress. Is it the House? Is it the Senate? Is it the majority? Is it the committee chairman? Is it the sub caucuses? So it's just a lot easier, you know, to, to write about to write about presidents. And in fact, in just the last year, we've seen new biographies, not, not just of Barack Obama, which is understandable, uh, but we've seen uh, new books written about FDR. Matt's dad did a great new book on, on, on FDR. Uh, we've seen a new book on, by James, about James Buchanan, uh, Chester Arthur, uh, even Millard Fillmore. And I'm, I'm partial to Millard Fillmore because my jug band in high school was named after Millard Fillmore, but <laughs> does it really, you know? As, as, and, and yet, in the 70-year history of the, of the Bancroft Prize and the Pulitzer Prize in history, there's never been a book that has gotten those awards uh, that has studied Congress. Uh, people prefer to study the presidency. It's just a lot easier. If you go look at the history sections, or you look at, at uh, uh, the biography sections, they're about, they're about uh, presidencies, because those people are very thoughtfully have all their papers arranged in one library, which is named after them. And so you know exactly where to go and read their stuff. And when I would ask folks in this book, well, where are your archives? They say, well, let me go down in the basement and see if I can find them somewhere. And even if they, even if they donate them to libraries, very often, as you know, the libraries will not catalog them uh, because you have to go out and raise tens of thousands of dollars. And most members are not, having retired from Congress, are not interested in going out and raising hundreds of thousands of dollars. They sort of left Congress in part to do that. So we're left without a lot of academic studies that Look in, you know, we have studies of the presidency. We have, when I was in grad school, you did slavery and you did African Americans and women, and I did labor. They've even given awards to the history of the cigarette, but there is not, there's not a lot on the history uh, of Congress. So I felt when I left the Hill, I wanted to go back, or as my wife would say, you wanted to go and do academic uh, work. And I wanted to write this book. And, and one of the reasons was I thought that, the, that we needed to have greater understanding about what this class actually did and what it, it, what it did do. Norm Ornstein is called the class of 74 the most consequential congressional class of the 20th century. And I, and I want to point out very clearly, this, is not, this book is not an homage to the class of 74, okay? They did some things that even they will uh, admit probably uh, were excessive or not particularly uh, wise over the long haul. And they also recognized some of the unintended consequences of what they did. But I think that it's important to have an overall record of what they did and also an analysis of the historical significance of what they did in terms of American government and, and the House uh, in particular. Most people who know anything about the class have said, not, not that true of people around this table as I look at Don and others, but most of the people who, who know something about the class of, of 1974 know two things. One is they were the Watergate babies a term I do not use in this book because I think it's intentionally disparaging. And the other is they came to Washington and they threw out three chairmen and, and then apparently they didn't do anything else. That was the end, that was the end of it. Um, 
Even Robert Remney, who was the historian of the House of Representatives, wrote a 500-page book on the House of Representatives, devoted less than a page to what Norm Ornstein has called the most consequential class of the, of the 20th uh, century. Um, part of that, their problem, I think, also was that among the people who spoke to the press, among the people who carried weight, they were not a tremendously popular group. Um, Tip O'Neill famously in his autobiography disparaged them. He said they never worked in politics, they never licked envelopes, they never walked door to door, they never, had, they never ran for local office. Uh, he, really, he really put them down and that was nice. One of the Republican leaders said they were a wild, uninhibited, downright rude, intemperate, and immature. And uh, you know, the interesting thing is most of that's not true. Um, in fact, when you go back and you look at them, member by member, background by background, it was a pretty diverse group of people. There, there were consumer advocates, there were small businessmen, there were the ministers, there were academicians, there was even a house painter, Eddie Beard from, from Rhode Island. There were a lot of people who were not necessarily skilled in, in electoral, activism, electoral politics, but had long histories in consumer activism environmental activism, anti-war movement, civil rights movement. So they were not inexperienced. But in addition to that, there, were lieutenant, there was a lieutenant governor, there were numerous mayors, there were many legislative leaders. And in fact, about the same proportion of people in the class of 1974 had held prior elective office as in the Congress and the House of Representatives uh, in general. Uh, but I think that these mischaracterizations had a way of minimizing their, their significance and, and contributing to a, 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 a misinterpretation of, their, of their, both their motives and their record. I think that they were impatient. There's no question about that. And there was a lot to be impatient about. Uh, the Congress was not the smooth running efficient machine that some uh, of their critics had made it out to be. But they were, they were impatient with what they uh, saw as an unresponsive elitist institution uh, and that was interpreted as hostility to the institution itself. And that was not a sentiment that they brought to Washington. Uh, they believed that they needed government to effectuate much of what they wanted to do. And they did not, like some of the other uh, wave classes that would follow them, run against the idea of the institution. They very much viewed the idea that they had to make the Congress more responsive and to make the Congress more efficient. Um, they actually, if you assess their voting records in the 94th and the, 90, in the 94th and the 95th Congress, or so 95 to 1980, they were the most loyal subgroup within the House of Representatives in terms of supporting the Democratic leadership and then later supporting uh, uh, President Carter. Uh, so far from being a rebellious, uncontrollable uh, group, they were, in fact, a pretty loyal uh, uh, a group of, uh, group of, of members. They were very heavily criticized uh, early in their, in their uh, careers for not achieving more, which when you think of it, I mean, yes, it was a large group of people. They picked up 49 seats. There were 76 new Democrats, 92 new members altogether. But you hardly walk into Congress the first couple of months you're there and effectuate uh, great change. And most of them did not even come here with the anticipation that that was their goal. When I talked with many of them, I asked, I asked all of them, why did you run for Congress in the first place? And what was shocking was that for a group of people who are predominantly known as the reformers, they didn't run to reform Congress. In fact, most of them hadn't a clue that Congress was in great need of reform. Time after time, I would ask them, they never heard of the Roosevelt Raiders or the McCarthy Marauders. They had never heard of the Hansen Committee or the Bowling Committee or the DSG Committee. These were all new to them. They didn't know anything about that. Uh, they, they said, you know, when we got here, we were told uh, if you want to accomplish the policy goals that you want to reach, you've got to make structural changes in this institution because the, 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 they will just swallow you up. Uh, and so they voted for the changes. But they didn't design these changes. They didn't design a single one of them. And if you go through the uh, records of the Democratic Caucus where these changes were made, none of the freshmen were playing a significant role in, in uh, articulating the, the reforms, although virtually unanimously, regardless of their ideology, regardless of their background, they supported them. They came to Congress almost unanimously, Democratic and Republican, the one that I spoke to, with one main objective. They came to end the war in Vietnam. 
That was their objective. And within four months, they voted a resolution out of the Democratic caucus. They terminated funding for the war, and they considered their tenure to be very successful. So when they had a slew of extremely negative press criticizing them not for not doing all sorts of other things which they never came to do and never promised that they would do, uh, they, uh, they were very surprised and, and, and somewhat, uh, they were somewhat discouraged. Um, the, uh, again, let's think though in terms of the, the challenge that faced them when they arrived. I mentioned that these changes took place within the Democratic caucus, and I mentioned that I was looking at the House. I'm looking at the House because more dramatic were changes were made in the House in the 94th than in the Senate, although the Senate did reform the filibuster rule in that, uh, in that Congress as well. The reason it was done in the Democratic caucus was that, as many of you know, in the House in general, the conservative coalition remained of dominant political, uh, the dominant political force. The coalition between Southern Democrats and the Democratic Party was still the, by far the dominant party in the South in the early 19 and mid 1970s. Uh, and the, and a significant, although not total, uh, portions of the Republican conference pretty well could dominate uh, the legislative activity of the floor. And it's one of the reasons that the class of 74 and the Democrats in the, in the 94th Congress weren't more successful. They would pass legislation, but they would not have the votes to override vetoes. Uh, because of the continuing power of the conservative coalition. Uh, they confronted a seniority system, which many of the existing reformers, those people who had put together the Hansen and Bowling reforms, the DSG reforms, the Dick Bowling, Don Frazier, Phil Burton, and others, uh, they were told, you know, you've got to take on some of these chairmen. You know, again, let's remember the chairman at that point were far different than the chairman that, that exists uh, today. Not only did they have the seniority system, they controlled most of the hiring. In some cases, they controlled the appointment of subcommittee chairs, the designation of who sat on subcommittees. You didn't have to go back very far prior to 1974 before committees were all held in secret. They did not have recorded votes. Uh, it was virtually impossible for even members in the committee would express concern. I don't even know what I'm voting for because the chairman held, held the information so tightly. Um, and so they confronted several of the chairmen. Uh, contrary to, the, to, to, to uh, the, the myth, they did not throw out all the conservative chairmen. They did not throw out all the southern chairmen. Uh, they didn't even throw out all the chairmen that the steering and policy committee they had recommended. The steering and policy recommended that they throw Wayne Hayes out, and they voted to keep him. They voted to throw people out who had behaved in an autocratic fashion and would not allow the committees to operate in a democratic way. So someone like Edward Bear, who unwisely began his discussion with the freshmen, the freshmen summoned all the chairmen to come and talk to them. And, and the chairman said, no, it doesn't work that way around here, okay? You're not even members yet. We're not coming to talk to you. And so uh, one of the freshmen said, well, that's fine. Then we'll just all vote against you. And then, you know, and he said, well, let, let's, let me get back to you on that then. And, and all of them came except, except for one who was ill. And, uh, but Edward A. Bear unwisely began his remarks by, by putting his hands on the table and saying, um, well, boys and girls, let me tell you how this place really works. Not a, not, not a good tactical decision, and he was one of the people who was thrown out. But he was thrown out not because he was just rude, not because he was from Louisiana, not because he, because he was uh, old or, or conservative. He was thrown out because he wouldn't allow people to offer amendments on the floor. He would not recognize people to speak on the floor if they didn't support his positions. Two years earlier, uh, he, had, uh, he had vigorously opposed the, uh, the request of Ron Dellum's from Berkeley and Pat Schroeder from Colorado to join the Armed Services Committee. Would have been the first woman, the first African American to join the committee. And when he was overridden by Wilbur Mills of all people, and they were placed on the committee when they were allocating the seats on the dais for the first day, he told Schroeder and Dellums that they had to share a chair uh, because they weren't full members of the committee in his view. Uh, Barney Frank later said it was the only half-assed thing Pat Schroeder ever did in Congress. <laughs> So I asked Pat when she told me the story, I said, Is, what, what did you do? She said, we shared the chair. What do you think we were going to do? That's what the chairman uh, told us we were going to do. Congress, remember, was, was still largely secretive. There was no television coverage. You, and other than Water, Watergate really provided the eye into the operations of Congress for millions and millions of Americans who had never seen a committee function. 
Nobody had ever seen the House floor functioning. Uh, it was a closed operation. Uh, it was a very elitist, it was a very autocratic uh, operation. And, and then, as Bella Abzug said, the, the reinforcements arrived. And suddenly, all these reforms that had been bottled up uh, since uh, the, 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 really the mid to late 50s and had never been able to break through um, uh, suddenly were able to be effectuated. Now, there had been some changes. There had been the Legislative Reform Act in 1946. There had been the Legislative Reform Act in 1970. There had been the Subcommittee Bill of Rights. But there was a whole slew of other reforms that broke down power, that made the leadership of committees more responsible, that allowed younger members with newer ideas to uh, gain a more aggressive and more participatory role. And those are the changes that were able to be forced through with the addition of this new group of people to the Democratic Caucus in 1974 and in early 1975. They rewrote the rules of the Democratic Caucus and for the first time, three of the chairmen were removed. It's interesting, incidentally, to note that in the next election cycle, six chairmen retired. Uh, so they sort of got the message that it wasn't going to be quite as good a deal as it, as it used to be, and, and uh, they, they were gone. So by the time you begin the 95th Congress, over half of the members, uh, over half of the chairmen are uh, first, uh, first term. And more important than that, they all have now had the lesson that you, you're, you disregard and, and you insult and you ignore the uh, younger members of the caucus at your, at your, uh, at your own peril. I want to also mention, though, as I, as I said at the outset, this wasn't the only thing going on in, in the 1970s that I think is, 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 is really significant and, and uh, that plays to the, uh, one of the major themes of this book, which is that if you want to understand contemporary American politics, if you want to understand the, the level of hyperpartisanship and, and polarization, which uh, has so uh, rearranged the, the nature of political contests, the political uh, debate, the legislative process within, within the Congress, you have to look back further than most people do. I asked everybody uh, who I interviewed, when do, you think, when do you think things went off the rails? And every Democrat I talked to said Newt Gingrich in the early 90s. And every Republican said Jim Wright in the late 1980s. But in point of fact, those people didn't just appear out of the blue. They arrived because of developments that are taking place as early as the, as the, the, 19, the early 1970s. So what am I talking about there? Well, one of the things I think is really important to understand is the revival of the Republican Party, which changes um, so much of the nature of American politics and to some extent was flying under the radar screen. After the Goldwater defeat of 1964, I think there was a general impression that, the, that if not the Republican Party, that at least the conservative wing of the Republican Party was dead. It had been repudiated. There was this gigantic uh, legislative victory, not only in terms of the presidency, but also in terms of the Congress. And it was for those two, two years that followed that the great society legislation, for the most part, Passed. 1966, there was a cataclysmic election. De Democrats lost dozens of seats, and there wasn't very much. I think there was one housing bill that was passed in 67, but the, the Great Society, which we think of as you know, the Johnson administration, actually only lasted uh, that first two years of, of, the, of, of his term. In the late 60s, Kevin Phillips publishes a book, and he says, you know, uh, if you think about what's going on in the South here, and particularly in the Sun, in the sun Belt and some of the suburban communities, if you look at the demographic changes that are occurring for a variety of different reasons, if you look at what's happened with white voting as a result of the Wallace phenomenon and the American Independent Party, and you put all those pieces together, the dying industries of the North, air conditioning in the South, the civil rights laws that suddenly made the South a more hospitable place for companies to locate their, 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 uh, their headquarters and their manufacturing facilities. There's an opportunity here, Phillips wrote, that, that the South doesn't have to be the, the barren territory that it has been traditionally for the Republican Party. And if the Re Republican Party becomes competitive in the South, then this natural democratic hegemony over the Congress is not going to exist anymore. That was a bizarre thing to be arguing for most people because people just looked around at the wreckage of the Goldwater uh, campaign and couldn't quite believe that that was 
that that was real. Um, but it was, it was, a, it was a, a very real threat. The interesting thing is that because of the, largely because of Watergate in 74, this huge election victory that, that Democrats had, uh, and then backed up in 1976 when they actually gained a seat, uh, they didn't lose, unlike the 1966 election that followed the, the 64 uh, wave election. Uh, if, you, if you look at the period 1932 to 1994, a period of 62 years, the Republican Party was in control of the House of Representatives for four years out of that entire period of time. Uh, and so the Republican Party, many of its leaders uh, and many of its members were developing a sense of being a permanent minority. There's actually, there were books that were written that, that talked about that right up until the fall of 1994. There were actually books being written about the permanent Republican minority. It took them 10 years to get back to where they, the Republican Party was in 1974. It took 10 years in terms of the House of Representatives to regain those seats. And once they did, they were regaining them with a different group of Republicans, a much more aggressive group, and a group that, that took Kevin Phillips' message to heart, that they, the numbers were changing, the ratios were changing, that it was a more competitive political environment for the House. Of course, they had the example of the Senate having switched in 1980, don't draw too many conclusions there because that's the states versus the, the, the district lines, but at least they could see a trajectory. And as Frances Lee, uh, she's written a great book called Insecure Majorities, has, has written, as the possibility of competition for control changes, as you get a revival, as the Republican Party switches from being holding about one third of the seats in the South to holding two thirds of the seats in the House over this period of time, the margins become closer, competition for control becomes an ever-present feature. And part of my argument is that uh, it becomes harder and harder to find co political consensus. Uh, and you see a, 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 a significant diminishment. The other, the other factor which I talk a little bit about in the book is that as you look at the nature of political debates in the beginning in the 70s, and, and, uh, and into the 80s, it's remarkable how many political issues are discussed in terms of rights as opposed to just, you know, this is my position. You know, you, it's hard to have a moral or cultural right around distribution of transportation money or, you know, the ESEA formula, okay? But many issues, whether it's gun rights or abortion rights or flag rights or veterans rights or disability rights or gun, whatever, they start having a, a very strong, sometimes quasi-religious uh, nature to them. And part of the argument I make is that it's, it's much more difficult to compromise on something that's a matter of rights or a matter of, of theology than it is to compromise on many of the other types of political issues which are more more easily uh, you split the difference. Uh, and uh, as these issues uh, align themselves as the ideological realignment of parties is occurring in the 1980s and the 1990s, the opportunities that are presented to have those fights within the Congress help split the parties further, uh, further and further apart. Now, I don't argue that, uh, that the House of Representatives, that the, the class of 74 caused partisanship. That's, that's not my point. But I do talk about the fact that a more open political process makes it easier for political combat to occur. So when you had a rules committee that just said, look, we're going to have three amendments on this bill, and, and you know, or Edward Bear would have his defense authorization bill on the floor and say, well, you know what, if you don't support the war in Vietnam, you can't offer an amendment, and you know what, you can't even speak, which is what he was doing in, in the uh, early 1970s. That's a lot different than having uh, the more democratized <clears throat> process where you had open rules, where we would have not uncommonly 300 amendments on the floor on a defense authorization bill that would go on for two weeks, Everybody could offer every amendment they wanted. And in this increasingly competitive atmosphere, of course, there became some, uh, a great deal of, of, of incentive to offer amendments that wouldn't necessarily pass, but might have political value because they would cause people on the political margins and the more 
uh, unsettled districts to have to cast votes. It weakened loyalties within parties. It opened factions within parties as well as between the parties. So to some extent, uh, those reforms helped create the vehicle by which this growing partisan uh, mix was able to find its way onto the onto the floor, but also into committees where, of course, you don't have any rules. So you don't have, I mean, you don't have rules that limit the, uh, the nature of amendments other than germaneness rules. And so these fights became ever present. Once the Congress made a decision to put its, it, its, uh, its deliberations on television, you know, Tip at one point when he was strongly opposed in the mid 70s when they first started proposing uh, uh, the, uh, uh, telev the television coverage uh, after Watergate, uh, he said, I don't think you want to do that. You know, you're going to find somebody picking their nose or scratching their ass and, uh, and that's all anybody's going to see. And, uh, and that's his quote, not mine. I wouldn't talk like that. And, and, you know, which is why, of course, as you know, you only have the face of the, of the speaker uh, that, that's televised uh, on C-SPAN. But the concerns that were raised were, you know, that, that with, greater, uh, with greater transparency, uh, there, uh, there, is a, there is a danger. And certainly I give uh, enormous credit, particularly to that rising group of Republican conservatives who realized that they couldn't control the House floor because they didn't control the agenda. They weren't in the majority, but they could control the special orders and they could control one minutes and they could effectively use the reforms procedures, greater ability to offer amendments, greater ability to speak on the floor, uh, to send messages, to build constituencies outside Washington at no expense to themselves. And so in effect, uh, reforms, you know, like so much of what we do in politics uh, had, had their own uh, unintended, uh, unintended consequences. Uh, let me just sum up by saying, I mean, it's, you know, at the time, look, this was a very heady group of people. They, they, they were young, they were by and large fairly progressive. Uh, 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 Les O'Coin, who came to Washington as the majority leader of the Oregon uh, House uh, in a seat that had never elected a Democrat to Congress before he called it a hinge point in history. He felt just that something changed with this group of people, with the, with the reforms and uh, the empowerment of younger members. Uh, something had changed. And Tim Worth, I found a great speech of Tim's that he had forgotten um, and probably wanted to forget that he gave in late 1975 where he, he talked about the, the arrival of the class of 74 as what he called a glory time. He said that the, it, the, the arrival of the class uh, har was the harbinger of a new era, which in his words, would emphasize openness and the non-systemic use of power, addressing not simply material wants, but moral aspirations as well. Okay, well, it didn't work out that way. And in fact, the early unity that the class found uh, around reform issues, which served their purpose as younger members, right, because that if younger members had greater opportunity to offer amendments or to speak on the floor to manage bills, if subcommittee chair were subcommittee, I'm sorry, subcommittee memberships were not going to be determined purely by seniority on the committee, you would allow younger members to fill up subcommittees and get good subcommittee positions. Uh, these were all the sorts of things that they, 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 they saw happening. They, that was to their benefit. And, and in fact, many Republicans, I have a, a chapter in the book on, on the Republican reformers. Uh, the Republicans were strong proponents of reform as well. Not always for the same reason, but they certainly, there were many of them and many of the Republicans in the class of 74 expressed frustration that they couldn't be more of part of the core group that was promoting the reforms because they were not members of the Democratic uh, caucus and and they they expressed great great uh, not only great uh, frustration at that but also great frustration at not knowing where they fit within a Republican Party that they found becoming more and more uh, conservative uh, and uncomfortable to 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 them. But what the class did find that was once they moved off the reforms where reform naturally benefited everybody, there was not quite as much unanimity. Um, I mentioned that they were they remained supportive of the overall legislation, but uh, in terms of the leadership's position uh, and and then later Carter's position, 
but they began to reflect the nuances of their own districts. And, and there were some that were not willing to be as, as consistently uh, liberal or as consistently um, uh, with the leadership as, as, uh, as they had been around the, uh, around the, uh, the reforms themselves. And yet the interesting, one thing that I found was interesting, um, and I found it because Charlie Johnson, who I think is here, gave me some papers that he found at the bottom of a desk. Uh, and, and these records from the Democratic Caucus, in late 76, maybe it's early 76, I'm forgetting, uh, the ability of the, of the Republicans to use these more open processes to force votes on amendments that began to really irritate the Democratic leadership. So there was a move in the Democratic Caucus to shut down some of the reforms. The, they only needed 20 votes uh, to ask for a recorded vote. And the idea was, let's change the rules and make it 36. Because we're just getting tired of, of you know, having to vote on so many of these controversial issues. And it's interesting, George Miller, who was my boss, coincidentally, I, don't, I didn't know this happened at the time, and speaking with him last week, he didn't remember that, he had, that this had happened. He stands up in the caucus uh, when this proposal is made, uh, and it's not made by necessarily even conservative people, it's made by liberals in the caucus who have been traditional reformers saying, we gotta stop this, okay, you're, you're empowering all these people to make our people look bad, particularly our marginal people look bad. And Miller said, um, look, uh, you know, I understand the tendency to wanna do that, but you know, and, and remember, this is 1976. He said, you know, someday we might be in the minority and we're, <laughs> And we're not gonna, you know, we're, we're gonna wanna be able to participate too. And, and the freshman class voted against changing the rules. They voted to maintain this ability of the minority. Now, they did change it a little while later because they got fed up with it and it got, it got to the point where they realized there was a problem. But early on, they were sticking with, they, they, they stuck with the reforms. But they did clearly, um, uh, they did clearly fragment more around around policy issues. And for that reason, as early, I think I mentioned earlier, as early as June of 1975, they are being ferociously criticized in the press for being failures, as being, f as flaming out. That, you know, they came here and they had such enormous promise and they didn't really accomplish much of anything. Now, first of all, that's incredibly naive. I'm talking about David Broder here, so I should be calling him naive, but it was a naive conclusion. Say that these people who were freshmen who didn't occupy any positions of leadership were going to change the organization of, of the Congress. It's a little, it was, uh, it was a little silly, but even the members realized that, that uh, Mark Hannaford, who was one of the freshmen from California, said, well, maybe we were, you know, maybe we were a little oversold uh, uh, at that. Uh, nevertheless, um, the class proved very enduring um, a lot of the uh, people who were elected in marginal districts, particularly white, more progressive whites from the South, uh, we had people like Butler Derrick, John Genrette, uh, Kenny Holland, Elliot Levitas, uh, endured for, for years um, because of the reforms that the class of 74 helped to support. Uh, they moved into subcommittee chairmanships fairly rapidly. There were, I, I, I believe that Blanchard became a, a, a chairman within his first, a subcommittee chairman within their first term. By 1982, uh, all, every remaining member of the class of 74 was either a subcommittee chairman or a member of a uh, exclusive committee. That, that kind of mobility simply could not have occurred. Uh, but for the kinds of reforms. And, and the reason, that's not just important because they got to hire a staff person. It means that with the greater autonomy that came in the subcommittees, they could also put issues on the table which the former chairman, and I'm sitting here looking at Phil Barnett who knows exactly what I'm talking about, would, would not have held hearings on. Uh, and because chairman had to be responsive to the caucus, if the subcommittee voted out amendments on a clean air bill or a clean water bill or a asbestos health bill or an education reform bill, the full committee chairman couldn't ignore them anymore because they had a power within the caucus that was supported by this, this progressive class uh, that, that demanded that they, they uh, be taken seriously. Um, so uh, just to, 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 uh, uh, to conclude, I, I, and then I'm, as I said, I'd like to open it for, uh, for, for comments, um, uh, I, I'm asked very often, so what, what do you think the difference is between this class and 
other wave classes, the classes of 94, uh, the class of 2010, both of them Republican uh, wave elections. And I do think that one of the major differences, um, and I think it's worth thinking and talking about in the context of our contemporary uh, political uh, environment, is that um, while this, this class of 74 ran critically of Washington, they didn't run critically of the institutions, and they didn't come here viewing the institutions as the enemy. Um, they, as I said at the outset, if you're a Democrat, let alone a liberal Democrat, you sort of need government to do what you want to do. And uh, if you look at the, the ideological motivation behind those classes in 94, and particularly in 2010, they're very much viewing the government as a problem. They're not looking at government notion of how do I streamline it, how do I make it more responsive, how do I strengthen its ability to function. And I think that has created enormous problems. I know it has just friends of mine who were in the Republican leadership uh, in terms of the management of their own, uh, of their caucus and also in terms of, of the overall impact in the, in the, in the operations of, of, of Congress. I, unfortunately, uh, to conclude where I began, you know, I think that, that uh, we've, the, the trends that in some ways began back in the 70s in terms of partisanship, in terms of institutional change have come full circle. We see a Congress again functioning with too many of those uh, limitations, too much deferral to the executive branch, too much hesitation. And I think that's on both parts in terms of the use of oversight. I think oversight has become so politicized that essentially if you're, if your Congress is of the same party, and this was true of us when we were in the majority with the Obama administration as it is today, you just basically cede uh, a lot of your, your uh, authority to the executive branch and you don't ask a lot of questions. Um, that's, uh, I think, uh, you know, a disturbing reversion uh, and uh, to, to these pre-reform era. Um, I don't, get into the book in a lot of, uh, as, as I do when I teach, you know, so where do we go from here? Uh, but I, certainly we've, we've, I think, arrived back at a, at, a, at a point where there are a sufficient number of challenges facing the Congress as a credible functioning legislative body that uh, we need a national discussion. Maybe this, maybe this book can help a little bit. Now, when George Miller used to do town hall meetings, he would go back and he would uh, you know, he'd spend an hour and a half, as all the members do, you know, telling them about everything that was done and how good it, he, what a great job he was doing and how all their concerns were his concerns. And, and then he was doing this one day at a place called Rossmore Retirement Home in Walnut Creek, California. And he, uh, I just always remember this story when I come to the end of the talk, and he asked if there were any questions. And the gentleman stood up and said, and George said, yes. And he said, yeah, what time is dinner? You know, so with that, uh, I don't want to get, you know, we're getting towards the end of the day. I don't want to get between you and your coffee break or whatever, but I'm happy to answer questions. Or again, I'd rather engage in a discussion with you folks about what I've talked about or anything else you'd like to raise. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. Simple ground rules. Wait for the microphone. Please identify yourself and use the microphone. Don. Don Wolfensberger with the Wilson Center. Thank you, John, for that uh, for your book. I look forward to, to reading it, and uh, I think you've made a very valuable contribution here. I guess I would just take issue with a, a couple of things. One is I, I came to the Hill in 69 and started working with the Rules Committee under John Anderson, and most of the bills that came to the floor between then and about 1980 were open to all amendments, all germane amendments. Only the Ways and Means Committee bills came to us and said, oh, you can't mess with the tax code, so they would allow maybe one Republican substitute or a closed rule and just allow a motion to recommit. And that all changed, I think, dramatically in 79 when, and then you sort of hinted at it, but when John LaFalse, who I believe was one of the Watergate babies, along with 40 members, wrote to Tip O'Neill, the speaker then, and Dick Bowling and said, we want more restrictive rules. We've got to shut down the amendment process. The Republicans are, are just offering too many things that are embarrassing in effect. I mean, that was implied. And that's when you see the curve of restrictive rules start to really climb. And the Republicans did it even worse when they 
took over and so on. But that was one of the things that was really noticeable and especially irksome. The other thing, though, that and the your sub your your subtitle really hints at that, and that is the 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 roots of partisanship. And I think what really happened was when the the class of '74 took over and they began to gain power, as you mentioned, at the subcommittee level, things became a little too chaotic. And there was this urge to start to pull things back together. And so there was more of a dependence or reliance on the leadership to pull things together. They started actually cutting back on subcommittees. At one point, there were 150 subcommittees in the House. So what you saw then was the rise of partisan leadership taking the place of what used to be committee power, committee chairmanships really dominating the process. And so I think you, you nailed it with the, the roots of partisanship. And that's when we saw that shift from committee power to leadership power. Thank you. Yeah, I do mention, I talk about the LaFalse letter in the book, and I think that was a very important uh, moment. It was sort of, it was the, the aftermath, if you will, of the, that discussion that took place in the caucus itself where people had, what is still to retain the, the, uh, the, um, uh, the open rules. And uh, uh, LaFalse, who, you know, was a, a more moderate Democrat upstate New York um, uh, put together this letter. I forget how many, but a significant number just saying it's enough already. And uh, there's no question that uh, I think that tightening down uh, enhanced the narrative of the Republican uh, members who were criticizing about the tyrannical rule of the, of the Democratic leadership. And the Democrats pretty continuously, right up until the late 80s, were providing them with good ammunition that that was exactly what was, that that was, exactly what was happening. Right here in the middle of the table, green sweater. Thank you. I appreciate uh, this opportunity to hear about the good old bad old days. Yeah. Oh, I'm Claudine Schweber, University of Maryland, University College. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think that what I heard was that some of this or a good deal of this part partisanship is connected to the changes in media action or media accessibility. That the introduction first of television and now with the kind of, you know, the gradual expansion of that, that intersection helps to foster or help to foster the partisanship because this could be seen back home or could be used for election purposes or whatever. Did I understand that correctly, that ap the absence of, of that kind of exposure before the 70s just because of the nature of the technology and the media, that this introduction helped to foster this partisanship or helped it become more visible or whatever word? I think the way I would answer it is that in an environment that was becoming more polarized, the availability of the television coverage exacerbated. I don't think the television made people more partisan, but as the issues and, and as the parties were becoming more ideologically realigned, as the issues that were being debated became more uh, these culturally divisive, easily, uh, e easily inflamed issues, the uh, accessibility to television coverage, and of course this, there's, there's an exponential increase as you go to social media. I think the extent to which that, that problem existed from the beginning. I mean, people clearly made a decision, I'm going to go to the floor and we're going to organize, ten, you know, one minutes to raise this issue or we're going to control the floor for an hour or two hours at night. Um, no question that happened, but just the availability of that would not have been the case without these more 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 polarizing issues. The problem, I think, and this goes beyond what I deal with in the book, um, becomes magnified significantly as you move further and further away from the kinds of filters and quality controls that existed in the good old days where, you, you know, you, Walter Cronkite wouldn't, it wasn't just rip and read, right? I mean, you had to pass through a series of filters before you got on one of the three networks. But once we moved to a media, to a cable heavy, uh, talk radio heavy, the fairness doctrine goes away, we move into social media. Uh, yeah, I think I, there's no question that it becomes much easier to, to, um, uh, to, to use the media to, to inflame those, those, those more polarized views. But the views exist notwithstanding the, the, 
No, yeah, I don't think. Philippa. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks again, John. It's, it's just such a wonderful book. And I have to tell you, there's one chapter in the book where John talks about why people decide to run for Congress. And he takes them one by one. And it's really, I wish I was still teaching American government because I would love to give that to my students. It's just totally illuminating. It's fabulous. Thank you. Um, but at the price of perhaps being known as a person who's bringing sex back into this discussion, I would like hurts. to ask yeah. you, to, <laughs> I'd like to ask you to speak a little bit about the women in the class of 74. Now, what you do say is that the women were particularly assertive. And I'm thinking about the way those women ultimately joined with the women who had come in in 72 and a few years later created the Congressional Women's Caucus, mm -hmm. which perhaps going against some of the trend that you mentioned was insistently bipartisan where from the beginning the decision was there would be co-chairs, one would be Democrat, one would be Republican. They would do everything by unanimous consent. They therefore took abortion off the agenda and said they weren't gonna deal with that one because it was too divisive. But I'm wondering to what extent all of these changes were important in helping to make the still minuscule but growing number of women in the House particularly um, able to combat what they certainly saw as a very male-oriented hierarchical society and then you know, make, go on to make a change. Well, again, now let me say, um, partly this may be, my response may be informed by my book, but it also may be informed by eight years that I spent as Chief of Staff to Speaker Pelosi and mm -hmm. uh, where I, you know, we sort of had to deal with many of these related issues. Um, there, the, so there weren't a large number of women actually in this class. Um, there were there were uh, some uh, Millicent Fenwick of New Jersey, who was uh, the most the oldest member of the class, a a uh, you know sort of the the horse set of cent, you know central New Jersey. Uh, Rush Holt, I'm sure, could speak about about that. There was Helen Miner uh, from New Jersey, uh, but it wasn't a large it wasn't a large cohort, but they, um, there was a, a clear change taking place right in this era. It didn't only involve the class of 74. I would put in the class of 72 and to some extent the class of 76. A, there is one story in the, in the, in the book about when uh, Pat Schroeder arrives in 1973. Pat's a 32-year-old Harvard lawyer from Colorado. She ran because, uh, because nobody else wanted to. They thought in the 72 would be a really bad year. And so she, she was able to get this nomination. Uh, and uh, she, uh, so she wins this race. She goes to, uh, to, to the Congress. And one of the first days she's there, she sees Lenore Sullivan on the floor. Lenore Sullivan's been there a long time. Not, not occupying a widow's seat. That is a seat that she had inherited from her husband, although her husband had been a member. Her husband had died. Mrs. Sullivan then ran for a different seat and won and had been there long enough to become the chairman of the Merchant Marine and Fisheries Committee. And uh, she went up to uh, Mrs. Sullivan to introduce herself. And as those of you who know Pat, Pat is a very outgoing and friendly manner. And she said, hi, I'm Pat Schroeder. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a freshman. Uh, you're my senior person on steering and policy. I'd like to, you know, introduce myself. And so Mrs. Sullivan said, yes, and I am Mrs. John B. Sullivan. And, and Pat said, oh, great. Well, you can call me Pat. What should I call you? And she said, you can call me Mrs. John B. Sullivan. <laughs> so, you know, I think there was a, um, there was a, you know, this was, there was a different group of women uh, uh, coming in. And it was clearly, you know, if you think in terms of who these people were, the Pat Schroeders, the Bella Abzug, the uh, Shirley Chisholm's. This was a different. Yeah, this, yeah. this was a different. This was a. This was a different group. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned the bipartisanship because there actually was a lot of. If you look at the Northwest, Northeast Midwest um, uh, uh, caucus, there were a number of the of the caucuses that made a big point of being bipartisan. Of course, that was possible because you had all this ideological division within the uh, within the both parties at that point. 
Um, but it also they had certain regional interests that was the commonality of, for, for them to, uh, to, to, to work together. A lot of that becomes less feasible um, as, as the ideological breadth grows. But I would also argue that uh, these kinds of uh, extra official caucuses can and may, may have gotten out of hand to some extent because they marry up with special interest money and with special interest causes and they get people, I mean, if you haven't checked out the list of caucuses in the House of Representatives, I defy you to find an issue that doesn't have a caucus and it puts people a little, I think, too much into defending their they're, you know, the, whatever the, the micro issue they've decided is, 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 is important. And I think it, to some extent it fragments rather than forms coalition. But that was a different matter because you could find these broad areas of, of agreement. Of course, having a women's coalition that agreed not to talk about abortion was a bit of a luxury because that was, you know, it certainly was one of the most divisive of, of issues. Anita Jones, retired from the American Historical Association. I have to ask this because um, some other people will, for sure. What, what did your training as an historian um, and a doctorate in American history do for you as you pursued this career of many years in the House? Uh. That's a, that's, a, that's a really good question. I used to get asked that question uh, slightly differently. Uh, it was more along the lines of, what makes you think? <laughs> um, you know, they would always say, but don't you think it's really hard to write laws if you're not a lawyer? And I said, believe me, the one thing we're not short of in this town is, is, is lawyers, and we, we can find them when we need them. Uh, I think that my, the way I've always thought of that is that it, it Historians think more about context and they think more about the evolution of issues than, um, than uh, I think ordinary human beings do. And one of the things that I found interesting in talking with the members uh, over a number of years that I did these interviews was, as I alluded to, they have great stories. They, have, they, they can tell you great anecdotes. They can tell you important meetings or discussions very rarely, I found, did they contextualize anything. Um, and when I would say, well, did you ever think of it in this context? Very often, they would say, no, I didn't. I didn't know anything about that. Um, I, that was sort of surprising that, you know, uh, or I would, I would, and they'd say, how did you know that? I said, well, I mean, I'm writing a book. I'm supposed to know about, you know, that, that, that particular subject. So it's, it's um, I think what history in some ways, I think it makes me more patient. I think it makes me less expectant of, of change happening at a pace that's not, that, that, that some people would like, because I think I know more about the struggles of political change and that, that uh, and it certainly informs my attitudes towards contemporary politics, that while it's easier as an advocate to propose precisely what you want to do, that change tends to last a lot better when it's been debated and when it's been modified and we've made an effort to incorporate other people's points of view. Um, and uh, I, think, I think the history training teaches you that. I mean, there are certainly points in history where compromise is simply not possible. And uh, there, there are times when the political circumstances are such that um, you know, if you want to accomplish anything, you're just going to have to go along without, without uh, the kind of collaboration. But I think those circumstances tend to pr produce more rocky, you know, uh, outcomes and sometimes less sustainable outcomes, even though they, they move the ball further down the road more quickly than, than the collaborative process might. So I, I think it's, I mean, I, I'm not sure that it's, uh, I don't know that we'd want an entire Congress of historians, but having a couple of them around doesn't hurt. Right here against the wall. Microphone's coming. <laughs> um, I, I was Pat Schroeder's Armed Services Committee staff person. When? 
1975 to 1977. Uh, so I remember Ed, uh, Eddie Abair not fondly. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> it comes off a little funnier in the book than it was yeah, at the time. No, no, in retrospect, they, it was funny. But, uh, but I just wanted to say, and I'm so delighted, I can't wait to read it. Um, but I just wanted to add a couple of things that are probably in the book. Um, I will say that um, you focused on Bear having blocked uh, amendments, et cetera, and being able to speak on the floor. My dis my, our frustration was we couldn't even find out when the hearings were. They, <laughs> they, they, wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't give us the calendar for the schedule until an hour before the subcommittee markup, so I used to have to get it on the, um, on the quiet from the younger staff members who would at risk of losing their jobs, call and, and give a heads up on that. So um, the amount of time that was involved in terms of you know, undoing that was really something. But I do want to say a couple of things about this idea of exactly how, how much we valued Congress as an institution. I myself was hired because in college I had done a paper um, a senior year paper examining all of the congressional hearings on Vietnamization policy, um, uh, which sadly wasn't that many because they were all classified. So I knew everything that could be done in the House and Senate. So she, Pat, when she was looking for someone for her Armed Services Committee work, specifically wanted a woman on the job, because uh, there were none uh, over there, um, and was delighted about the Vietnam policy stuff. But what we really wanted, in addition to knowing what the time the hearings were, we wanted to be open up, it sounds like it's a big deal. Um, we wanted to use the congressional hearings as an opportunity to educate people about the policy. So in 1976, um, one of our big pushes uh, for House Armed Services Committee was, for the first time ever in January, as we were getting ready for the defense budget bits, we managed to convince to get a petition going among all the members of, of the House uh, of the House members, um, including a Republican, Bill Dickinson, uh, at that time, to invite outside w expert witnesses for the first time ever on the committee to get a hearing for have an alternate view to uh, b beyond just what the administration was doing. Um, and then from that, you know, we then were working with people on the Senate side as well because that was more open over there. So that was very exciting. And then in 1977, I went from there to the Carter administration being the legislative person in the Pentagon. And so from that, um, I successfully pitched to the assistant secretary the idea of having Secretary Brown brief the 94th and uh, 96, no, the 74, class of 74 and class of 76 ca uh, caucuses separate from any committees on the B-1 bomber because we were not having good progress with that in the armed services. And my boss was just horrified at the idea of just dealing with this non-committee group. And I said, really, really, they are our friends. And so that established that, and we, I called up this new guy, Leon Panetta, yeah. who happened to be the chair uh, of the caucus at that point, who loved it, arranged it. We then built on that to get a White House meeting that involved those people as well. So really that effort of ex broadening access um, to foreign and defense built on the Vietnam policy, built on the openness, built on a belief that Congress does have such a potential, and it breaks my heart to see what's, you know, happened now. Yeah. So. I, I really appreciate that, and I, I wish I had talked to you before I wrote yeah, the book. Yeah, I'm sorry Because, about um, <laughs> because I, you know, I, I, again, you're just reiterating, people don't appreciate how closed this system was, and the, let alone the notion that somebody who was a freshman or a sophomore member was gonna demand that people come. I mean, there were literally were, um, uh, I should have written this book 20 years earlier. My memory would be better. But I mean, there were people on, on, on uh, the ag committee where you could not ask, you would be able to ask questions based on how long you had served in Congress. And people got to ask questions until they were tired.
and then you you know if you were the the junior members, you might be asking questions on the third day, or you might not get to ask questions at all. The, I mentioned that we didn't have recorded votes. We didn't have printed hearing records. I have a quote in here from Charles Jolson from New Jersey, where he, uh, he expresses his frustration as a member of the Appropriations Committee. He went to his subcommittee chairman and said, I'd like to see the report that we're going to vote on. They said, no. House. And he said, he said, no. I said, what do you mean, no? He said, well, the chairman says you can't see the report. He said, wait a minute, I'm a member of the committee. What do you mean? You, you've got the report. I can't see it. And they said, no, you can't. So Jolson quit and became a judge. You know, but that, that it was, it was, you know, such a tightly regulated system that, so when these freshmen showed up and just, just starting off said to, uh, said to uh, the, uh, uh, the chairman, you're going to have to come and talk to us. We're not voting automatically for, for you. I, I mean, now it sounds it's almost routine, but at the time it was, it was unbelievable that anybody would, would do that. Right here, Matt. I'm I'm Matt Dalek from uh, GW. Uh, John, how did writing this, uh, and thanks for the great book and great talk, but how did writing this book change your view of, if at all, of political reform? I mean, you had 38 years, obviously, at extremely high levels in the House. You saw a lot of reforms come and go and their impacts, some uh, uh, unintended, play out. Um, did kind of writing this book, looking back historically at a process that, that was heavy on uh, institutional reforms, did that in any way make you more uh, uh, cynical or hopeful about the reform process? I think where you stand on reform has a lot to do with where you stand in the hierarchy. And, uh, you know, uh, when I was chief of staff to the speaker, I probably wasn't quite as enthusiastic about uh, some of the ideas that some of our more junior members came. I mean, it's always a dilemma. Um, in the book, I talk about how the, the uh, one of the, 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 the uh, challenges that these, these people in 1974 had, they were very angry at the uh, senior, at the, at the leadership, because uh, they would not punish the senior members who were voting against it. At some point, the, there was a significant number of the House chairmen, because of the seniority system, where they were, those Democratic chairmen were voting with Republicans 80% of the time. Okay, and the, these younger members said, hey, you know, we gotta get rid of these people. You're, you're the Speaker of the House. They're voting against us on overriding vetoes. It's your responsibility. But of course, so they wanted this, the leadership to crack down. Uh, but of course, when they wanted to do things and they didn't want to have to be pushed into voting uh, for positions that the leadership wanted, then they would say, well, wait a minute, you can't push us around. You know, we have our, you know, we're, we have our own interests. You know, we have to represent our district. So there's always a tension, I think. Um, you know, it, they, they always use the, the expression, you know, it's like herding chickens and, 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 and it is, you'd like, You'd like to have people to be obedient when you need them to be obedient, and then when they don't, when you don't need them to be obedient, then you let them be a little more fr frisky. And and but it doesn't always break down that way, unfortunately. I mean, I guess I come down to the fact that there is down in the conclusion that there is a natural tendency in bureaucracy for the more senior people to try to shut the place down and run it their way and run it efficiently. And as uh, any of you who study, it, it was not designed to be efficient, and it doesn't disappoint. Uh, it, it, it was um, ultimately, I think, Congress is most successful when it has the opportunity to operate. It has the opportunity to force ideas to be debated and it, to um, allow people to find the, the comfortable position, realizing that it's not going to be necessarily what you want. You may have to go back and fix it in two years or expand it. Um, I think to some extent, um, uh, both my congressional experience and maybe it's reflected in the book has made me something more of an incrementalist than I'd like to be. But um, I just think that tends to be, uh, you know, you, what, what's the old saying? You, you, you campaign in, in poetry and you govern in prose. Uh, you know, I think that there's a lot of, of, of truth to that in terms of if you're, if you're object, I mean, there are different objectives, I think. Um, but one of them clearly has to be to have policies, not only that you get implemented, but policies that can then endure. And to endure, they have to have some level of consensus. And to have consensus, that means you actually have to sit down and talk to people you don't necessarily agree with. One of the things I always tell my classes, and of course my classes are 18-year-old students who have spent their whole lives in California, 
a very big world view, uh, you know, and uh, very impatient. And I say to them, you know, because um, my job is to teach them real polity, right, is I always say to them, um, you know, there's a difference between uh, um, advocacy and politics. Advocacy is me telling you what I want, and politics is me getting you to agree with what I want to do. And those are two different skills, um, and you can't confuse them. And if you're, you know, it's why I think it's difficult when advocates come into the system, into the, into the political system. They've, they've got to recalibrate to some extent, and it's difficult for some to do, and they just remain gadflies and show horses. And the more successful ones are the ones who know that you're going to get something this year, and then two years later you're going to get more because as you build the credibility of an idea, it becomes easier to expand it rather than to simply insist that you get it the, the whole loaf at a time. So I guess it's, I guess, uh, but if you, do me a favor, please don't tell Nancy Pelosi I think I'm an incrementalist because she has, that's not, that's, that's not a good term as far as her. Brown coat. Thank you. Adrian Stefan of the State Department. Um, you've kind of answered the last two questions alluded to this, but, and it sounds like it was a pretty horrible situation in 74, but looking back, would you say that that debate that you said was necessary, and would Congress be more effective if the reforms had not taken place? I mean, overall, do you think W with, with all the problems we have, that it was worth it? Or would you like to jigger it if you had an alternate history opportunity? No, I mean, the, the, the objective is not to make Congress efficient. The, it's to make sure that different perspectives and different viewpoints can participate. And uh, politics and democracy are messy. And that's just it. And, and it, it, you can make the whole thing a lot more efficient. Uh, but um, that's not going to, you know, we have other objectives than efficiency, in my view. Alan here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Alan Crowd, American University. I wanted to ask about institutionalization, institutionalism. Uh, before, uh, John, you alluded to the fact that this was a class, the class of 74 comes here, and they are not anti-institutional. There's not a visceral reaction against the institution. And yet we've seen what may be really a reversion to an older kind of institutionalism. And here I'm asking you to put on your historian's hat and think back to the 19th century and to the early part of the 20th century when the spirit of party was much stronger in many ways. Uh, are we not reverting to something that existed in American politics and that for a period of time, maybe a very brief sparkling moment, uh, was put aside in the name of policy making during the mid 20th century and is now reasserting itself again. Yeah, I think that's true on a lot of levels. I think, you know, I, I refer to this, this era of the mid century as a blip where we sort of lived in, 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 an, in an illusory world for, for a lot of different reasons. Um, and I think it's the, you know, whether it's, it's that kind of political consensus, but also I think it's economic superiority and military superiority and American exceptionalism and all these ideas that took root and, and that very much formed the consciousness of people who grew into maturity in that era. And as they look now at, at a, a world in which America is less dominant and, and less able to direct the flow of world events, I think uh, what Richard Hofstetter used to refer to as the paranoid style has, has, found its, uh, has found full flower here, that we've got to find a reason why this has happened. It can't just be because of the evolution of politics and the evolution of world economies. There's got to be somebody's doing something bad uh, as, as a result. You know, we, we, we had a few decades there where the rest of the, where all of our competitors were literally in rubble. Uh, and we were able to play a role that is simply not the same world anymore. And I think if one looks at the level of anger that we see in politics right now and the level of stratification, um, it's, it's partly as a result of the, a sense of loss of, that, of that, um, that frame of mind, however short-lived and however naive it, it, it was. So we're seeing more anger now than was true of the class of 70. Yeah, I don't think that they were particularly angry. I mean, they were frustrated, and certainly um, they, the, the, they were they were um, they were 
more probably over Vietnam than any other issue. Um, but again, they saw the, they saw uh, uh, a, an unresponsive government. They saw a policy that made absolutely no sense that was tearing the country apart, costing enormous amounts of money, and yet they saw this, this institution incapable of responding to what was happening on campuses and what was happening in, and, and again, it, it let's, you know, I think it's very, very important to keep in mind that, that, that much of, the, of that reaction it wasn't partisan, it was on a bipartisan basis. Uh, you know, and if you look at any of the major issues that were happening, whether it was women's issues or environmental policy or arms control, they were all bipartisan issues. Um, it, there, was a, there was a consensus that the institution was not functioning. Uh, in, and, and if you go back and look at, at as we were saying, you know, talk to Larry Pressler or talk to Gary Myers or all these, these people who were the Republicans who won in 75, they're saying the exact same thing. They were saying the exact same thing. So I think there was this sense that, that uh, it wasn't an anti-institutional, it wasn't destroy the institution, it wasn't discredit the institution, it was, but it was very much that the institution was not functioning correctly and had to be changed radically. Gentleman right here to my left. Uh, yes, thank you, sir. Uh, Adam Younger, uh, State Department um, history enthusiast. Um, so you had said that 74 was the first time ostensibly that the Congress had found its footing to conduct oversight and to, and to assert itself. Um, I'm brought back 20 years to the McClellan hearings um, with Roy Cohen and uh, um, uh, Bobby Kennedy, where uh, it, it wasn't televised, right? But there were photographers in the room, if I'm correct. Well, McCarthy hearings were McCarthy televised. McCarthy prior they to were that. Televised, okay. Yeah. So can you maybe comment on, on those two hearings in the 50s and how that and why, and why that proceeded? They, I, I, I didn't mean to say that there wasn't any oversight, but it, okay. wasn't, it wasn't institutionalized oversight. There were, mm -hmm. there were certain key moments, like the, the Army McCarthy hearings and McClellan hearings, that uh, the, I don't remember whether or not the, the, the Truman hearings were televised, probably not, because they weren't at the end of the war. I mean, there, but the, the nature of oversight changed. So by the time you get it to the 94th Congress, certainly the 95th Congress, and Charlie might be able to correct me on this one. Uh, I think it, there was actually a rule that every committee had to have an oversight committee, and uh, so an oversight subcommittee. And there was this notion that an integral part of your responsibility as a committee was not simply to write legislation; it was to have this <coughs> investigatory role. Uh, I mean, you know, I guess one could argue that maybe we've got a little too people got a little over their skis on that. Uh, uh, to it from from time to time, but um, this notion that Congress was going to hold the executive branch accountable, um, was going to look at how programs function, was going to take Congress out of Washington and go hold hearings in in in, uh, in communities, that became much more an institutional feature of Congress than it was in these earlier periods where you did have periodically the Congress would. Uh, would uh, uh, play that role, but not as, an, not as a regular institutional basis. So I'm gonna get the last question in. Your focus in the book seems to be, from what you've been saying, a, an emphasis on processes um, and rules that change. So a more open process makes it more possible for conflict to occur. Uh, there's committee power giving way to uh, chairman, chairmanship power, uh, and this contributes to the roots of, of partisanship. In the literature that I've been reading, the emphasis is less on what you're bringing into the discussion than it is on the evolution of ideas and the infrastructure for expressing those ideas. So before and especially after the Goldwater debacle, uh, the right builds an infrastructure. Uh, and this is what allows Reagan, almost in 76, but certainly in 80, uh, you know, to become the candidate. Uh, this fuels um, a ideological right. Uh, something else happens with the Democratic Party, you know, after, seven, well, with 72 and after, uh, that leads to its fragmentation. You em emphasize, you know, all the caucuses that are, people are a part of. Uh, perhaps there's less discipline. So could you kind of balance these, um, you know, the ideas, in infrastructure ideology part with the process part. Um, you know, had these changes in process not taken place, would partisanship have been slower to manifest itself um, or would it just have delayed, delayed the uh, inevitable? 
Yeah, as I said earlier, I don't think that the institution of the reforms themselves caused, caused the partisanship. I think they provided vehicles yeah. by which partisanship that was occurring because of all these demographic changes, ideological changes, even even the movement of, of, of people uh, that impacted reapportionment and redistributed congressional seats. Um, uh, the, the 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 reforms enabled those to find expression. There's, you know, there's a growing literature on looking at what happened with the rise of evangelicism, what happened in the, in the response to the 74 campaign finance laws, what happened with the uh, independent money that, and, and I think to some extent that's more aggressive on the Republican side because the Republicans were so long a congressional minority. They didn't control the institutions of, of Congress and to the extent to which they were going to develop legislative proposals and they were going to have that capability, they had to build institutions that were that were outside the outside the, the, the formal political institutions and those those formed well. But they also were able to form absent the kind of moderating influence mm -hmm. that internal ones do. So they had a more hardline ideological base to them, and that that helped fuel, I think, a competition within the Republican Party that you saw through my, you know, it, it was interesting to me that in, uh, and again, there's this whole chapter in the, in the book that deals with the, the, the changes going on within the Republican caucus over this conference over this, this period of time, was uh, the extent to which Reagan was not viewed as the, as the most appropriate uh, leader of that revolution by the grassroots and evangelical and hard ideological uh, groups that, that that were rising as early as the late 50s, and certainly with the Powell memo in 71, became more organized, and 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 uh, they really viewed Jesse Helms much more as the as the leader who they. Well, I mean, they yeah. they I, at one point, and it's in in the book, they refer to one of the I, I forget exactly who, who which which person it was, but they refer to refer to Reagan as just a lightweight. Um, because the, he was, you know, he's a Hollywood guy, and he was a bit of a philistine when he lived out there, and he, he couldn't necessarily trust him. They really needed somebody who was more hard line, and and these outside groups that had had grown up in sort of this purist environment with their own sources of money, they didn't have to live within the environment of a of a competitive, collaborative legislative body, uh, were able to to grow and develop both legislation and ideological lines, which you know, when married up with people who had a legislative bent, like, like a Gingrich, and had a, a legislative strategy, proved very volatile and proved very effective. Thank you. The book, is it now available in bookstores? Uh, it's in the warehouse, uh, they, <laughs> as of last night. They, they told me that it should be out uh, in, in bookstores uh, very shortly. It's being shipped out. I don't know what that means. Great. On that note, I have to draw this to a close. If you look uh, in the back there, you will see bottles of wine. So you don't have to go very far uh, for our light reception following uh, this, this talk. If you'll join us next week on March 12th, Stephen Kotkin will be here to talk on volume two uh, of his Stalin Waiting for Hitler, 1929 uh, to 1941. Thank you to our I, participants. I just mention, I do, we do have some books that the publishers ah. sent here. So... I can, I can, uh, I guess I have to sell them, but I, <laughs> I that my, sounds rough. But, yeah, but my, uh, my son gave, gave me something online where I'm supposed to be able to do credit cards, but of course I will screw that up. But if you have, if you want a book and you have cash or a check, I can probably do that. I'll even try the other one. Thank and you. And so thank you, John Lawrence. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate having the opportunity.